In Matthew 22, 37, Jesus states that the greatest commandment is, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. If you want to follow this command, then you must learn to put God first in your life. God wants you to give Him every piece of you, and you can only do that if He is number one in your life. There are plenty of ways to put God first. Some are easier than others, but each one is important to maintain if we want to love the Lord as He commands us to love Him. Getting into a routine of beginning and ending your day with prayer will greatly help you keep your eyes on the Lord throughout the day as well. The first thing you should do every single morning is give a prayer of thanks to the Lord for keeping you safe throughout the night. Do this before you get your coffee, before you eat your breakfast, before you even get out of bed. You might spend more time with the Lord doing morning devotions after you have done those things, and that's great, but the very first thing to do is thank the Lord. It doesn't have to be a long prayer, it just has to be a heartfelt one. If you can't think of what to pray, you can simply say the Lord's Prayer. When you begin your day with the Lord in this way, you are reminding yourself that your life belongs to Him. The very air you breathe comes from the Lord, and it is only due to His mercy that you are taking it in to sustain your body. He watched over you during the night and kept you safe so that you might live another day on the planet He made. You remind yourself of His almighty power in giving and taking away life, and of His love that He protected you when you were most vulnerable. Sometimes our lives seem like a burden, but they are actually a wonderful gift from God that we should never take for granted. By putting God first in a literal sense every day, you will find it easier to put Him first in a mental sense as well because He will be first and foremost in your thoughts. Ending your day with prayer is also an important aspect of keeping God first in your life. You must thank God for keeping you safe during the day and ask Him to continue to watch over you as you fall asleep. If you have children, you may recite evening prayers with them each day, but do you do the same for yourself? You must look back on your day through the lens of one who fears God and approach Him in humility and love. No matter how tired you may feel, take a minute to pray to the Lord before you fall asleep. When you begin and end your day with God, it will be easier to keep Him in mind throughout the day. Just like any relationship needs nurturing, so does your relationship with God. In order to put Him first, you must continue to develop your relationship with Him and constantly be getting to know Him better. The best way to learn about God is through the Word, and the best way to learn about the Word is by reading it for yourself and hearing it preached. Let's focus on reading it for yourself first. Like with any book, you have to set aside time to read the Bible. But unlike other books, the Bible should be read every day, and it is meant to be read over and over again. The Word is not a fiction novel that you read once and then place on your shelf to gather dust. Rather, it should be well-worn and opened and read daily. There is no end to the wisdom to be gained through the Bible. No matter how many times you read the same passage, the Lord can reveal something new to you each time. God gave us the Bible so that we would learn about Him through it and use it to develop our relationship with Him. You must set aside time every single day to spend time in the Word. You have to decide for yourself when that time should be. Some people find it best to do their devotions in the morning, others do it at night, and some do it in the afternoon. It doesn't matter when you do it, as long as you make the time for it and sit down with no distractions. Reading the Bible isn't something you should simply squeeze into your schedule while waiting for the bus or riding the elevator. You have to make time for it rather than simply find the time. Bible reading must be intentional and focused. There are many different ways in which you can read the Bible, and you can switch it up every time you go through it. Maybe you'll want to read the Bible for the first time all the way through, from beginning to end, and the next time, read it chronologically, or start with the New Testament, and then read the Old Testament. You could even flip between the Old and New Testaments, or be reading them both at the same time. 
There are plenty of different Bible reading plans available for when you want to switch up your reading, which can keep it fresh and interesting as you continue to get to know the Lord through His Word. But your Bible learning doesn't have to come only from the Bible. You may come across passages that are confusing or seem contradictory and therefore have questions about them. This is when it is incredibly useful to be part of a church family. It can be extremely valuable to have a pastor to turn to with your questions because they have spent so much time studying the Word and they may have answers for you. It's also great to have a church family to turn to with not only your questions about the Bible, but also for prayer and support during difficult times. It is much easier to put God first in your life when you are surrounded by others who are doing the same. You can keep each other accountable in Christ and encourage one another in your walk with God. By helping others put God first, you are helping yourself put Him first as well. Having discussions with others about certain Bible passages can bring new insights that you never would have discovered on your own. Don't keep the word to yourself, but share it with others and dive deep into it with your Christian family and friends. When you come to a crossroads in your life, who is the first person you turn to? Is it your spouse? Your mother? Maybe a close friend or mentor? There's nothing wrong with turning to others for advice, but if you want to put God first in your life, you have to turn to Him first. He should be the first one you consult with about any decision, especially the big ones. While your family and friends may have your best interest at heart, they don't know what is best for you in the same way that God does. He can see your future and He sees where each path will lead, so He knows the best one for you to choose and He can lead you there. When you are faced with any kind of big decision, like whether to accept a job offer, whether to propose to your girlfriend, or whether to start a family now or later, you must turn to God with these options and ask Him what is best. If you want to put God first, you will take into account which option is best for God's glory rather than your own personal growth. By placing God first, you are giving your life to Him and living it for Him rather than yourself. So when God tells you to choose the option that is less preferable to Him, you must follow His direction and trust in His leadership. You have to be willing to give up everything for God. When a rich man approached Jesus and asked what he must do to enter heaven, Jesus said, If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. God demands that His people place precedence on righteous things of heaven rather than temporary rewards on earth. It is not wrong to have riches on earth, but if you are unwilling to sacrifice them all for God's glory, then God is not your priority. We must be willing to do whatever God demands of us. That also includes following His commandments. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul. But Jesus says, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Loving God is one thing. He loves us even more than we could ever love Him, and He sacrificed His only Son for us. But loving your neighbor? That can be tough. When someone is rude to you or has a nasty personality, it can be hard to treat them with love and kindness. But that's exactly what we are called to do. Loving God means loving your neighbor, which includes not just those in close proximity to you, but all of the people in your life. To put God first, you have to learn to put others first as well. Making God the number one priority in your life is not necessarily going to be easy, but it is certainly doable, especially if you follow these tips. Begin and end your day with a prayer to keep your mind on the Lord throughout the day. Make time to spend with God reading and studying the Word to get to know Him better. Get involved in a church so you can turn to others with any questions you may have about Christianity or the Bible, and so you can help others in their journey with Christ as well. Whenever you face a crossroads, turn to God first and ask Him for advice before you turn to anyone else. You are living for Him after all, and He knows the best course of action better than anyone else. To put God first, you have to put everything else below Him, and that includes earthly riches. Be prepared to give up anything or even everything to follow Him, and treat others with the love and kindness that Jesus demonstrated to all mankind. 
in everything you do, consider what God wants from you and be brave enough to do that. Follow where He leads you and ask for His guidance and for the courage to do what He wants you to do at all times. The Bible teaches us to make God a priority in everything we do. However, it's not just about putting Him first. It's also about understanding that He wants to guide you on the right path. God wants to help you become who He has called you to be. Sometimes we get so caught up trying to figure things out on our own that we forget to involve God. When that happens, it can lead to unexpected problems and hinder us from fully becoming who God intended us to be. In this video, you will understand what it truly means to put God first and the benefits attached to it. So, ensure you watch to the end to learn these profound truths. You've read and heard a thousand times the popular Bible verse, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all other things shall be added unto you. The first question is, what does it mean to seek God first? Because seeking God first is synonymous with putting God first. When you know what is expected of you and the rewards attached to it, you will understand better the repercussions of going against it. Seeking God means consulting God over every issue of your life without excluding anything, no matter how petty. It entails enthroning God as the decision maker over the affairs of your life, where His will becomes your will. His dislikes become your dislikes and his passions and burdens becomes yours. When this becomes the reality of any man, then it can be said that such a man puts God first. The next question from the Bible passage is, what are the other things that would be added unto you? Do you want cars, fame, respect, fulfillment, prosperity, and peace? You name it. As long as God sees you in the capacity and maturity to manage them well, he will release them unto you. Though all these blessings may differ from person to person, one thing is sure, you will enjoy the blessings of heaven. You might be doubting if it's possible to have all these things mentioned, probably because you know of people who gave their all to God but lived in misery and sadness. Listen, beloved, there are so many things a lot of people do not know about God. Serving and sacrificing for God first because what you'll receive from Him is not the same as putting God first. It's as good as serving God with hidden motives, which is what many of us do. When you put God first, you become a man after his own heart, and he will never deny you the good things of life. Even when you go through turbulent times, you can be sure he will bring you out or compensate other aspects of your life. However, you shouldn't exude such confidence if you don't put God first. Now that you know the package of blessings that comes with putting God first, you should be able to perceive the package that comes with doing the opposite as well. It simply means the opposite of all the good things in life. Yes, it's as simple as that. Hold on a moment before you conclude that God is a wicked God. No, He is not. They are simply the laws of nature. When you do this, you reap this. And when you do that, then you reap that. Besides, there are laws that govern a community, an institution, a state, or a country. The same is applicable to the children of God. The scriptures contain laws that govern us in this kingdom. When you do what is needed, you reap the rewards. But when you neglect it, you reap the rewards as well. The danger of not putting God first in whatever you do is that you expose yourself to the attacks of the devil. The truth is that the devil has free will to influence what is done outside of God because God is only responsible for what he initiated. He won't take responsibility for what is outside his jurisdiction. When you fail to put God first, you are indirectly asking him to take his hands off your affairs so he lets you be. Moreover, when you are in God's will, you can be assured of his presence with you. Moses understood that when he said that he wouldn't go unless God went with him. Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, and they were on their journey through the wilderness to the promised land. He was concerned and he had a deep desire for God's presence to go with them on their journey. Exodus chapter 33, verses 14 through 16 says, The Lord replied, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish your people and me from all the other people on the face of the earth? 
God's presence is the only assurance of success in whatever you engage in. Whether it is in your business, marriage, or career, do not start anything without checking if it is God's will. God will never mismanage you. You can trust Him to lead you in the best direction for your life. That's a good idea. You can ask Him if you should go ahead with it. Before you say yes to that proposal that comes with huge benefits, ask God if it is what He wants for you. God doesn't want to be a commander who will always dictate to you what to do, but He wants to help you go through life. He doesn't want you ever to be stuck in life or to find yourself in a position that won't favor you. When you inquire from God before you make any move, He will be able to guide you to the right path because He knows the end from the beginning. Have you wondered why David never lost a battle? If you go through the history of the war that David fought, you will find out that he inquired from the Lord before doing anything. When God doesn't come first, your primary focus will be on material things, and that is dangerous. The effect of this is that it can cost you a quality relationship with God. He could also limit you from assessing all that belongs to you in the kingdom. There is an emptiness that comes with living without God on your side, you don't want to ever be in this place. We were all created to worship God, and if we fail to do this, it means we are living outside of God's purpose. Just as a product becomes ineffective if it deviates from its intended function, humans too were purposefully designed by God. If we don't strive to maintain a deep connection with God, we might miss out on the purpose He has for us. Stop seeking material things and start seeking God. Remember, that it is when you seek God's kingdom first that these material things will be added to you. As believers, we were not designed to run after material things because God has given us dominion over everything that He created. We are to call them forth into our lives, not run after them. Scripture says in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. God intends to lead us and not our instinct or wisdom. The danger of not allowing God to lead you on what to do is that you will most likely make the wrong decision. Remember the story of Saul when the Philistines threatened the Israelites. Samuel instructed Saul to wait for him at Gilgal. He did because he wanted to offer burnt offerings and make supplications to seek God's favor before going into battle. As the Philistine threat grew, Saul felt the pressure of the situation. Saul waited for Samuel for seven days, as Samuel had instructed. However, when Samuel did not arrive as quickly as Saul had hoped, Saul decided to offer the burnt sacrifice himself. If we are being honest, Saul exercised patience, but that patience wasn't enough. This shows that no matter how long you have waited on God, it is dangerous to move when he hasn't said anything. Samuel thought he was doing the right thing. Little did he know what would befall him. See what happened. As soon as Saul finished offering the sacrifice, Samuel arrived. The single action of Saul caused him to lose divine favor. God knows the right time for everything. Don't be in a hurry that you end up making grievous mistakes like Saul. If you have lost anything because you were not patient with God, may God restore all that you lost in Jesus' name. Amen. As humans, we focus our attention on what seems to be important. On our scale of preference, we know what comes first. But when you don't consider God and His values in whatever you do, you are simply saying He is not that important to you. You don't have to say it with your mouth, but your action says it all. This is not the best attitude to have. A life outside of Jesus will experience chaos. The devil will always have the opportunity to penetrate such life. Although God doesn't wish for us to be prey to the devil, he won't act unless we invite him to do so. Prayer is a means of submitting a situation to God and asking him to take control of your life. A person of prayer will always be sensitive to God's leading. On the other hand, a prayerless man will always be a victim of circumstances. When you put your trust in men, they might disappoint you, but God won't. Whatever you entrust in his hand will never die. Practice talking to God about everything that concerns you. Allow Him to shower His love on you. Does it matter how far you have gone in doing things your way? You can do things better now. God is waiting for you. If only you can seek God first, 
Everything that you need will come to you. There is no need to be anxious about what tomorrow holds. God has promised to give you what you ask of Him. It is sad that when we chase the things of this world, anxiety, stress, and worry take over our lives. That's because we can never derive satisfaction from what the world gives. Only God can truly satisfy. In seeking God, peace is always assured. Although challenging times come, you have comfort and a sense of security because you are certain that God is with you. Instead of trying to figure out life yourself, why don't you trust God with your life and see what He makes of it? No one seeks after God and regrets it, and you won't either. Just as people's faces are different, so are priorities. Some prioritize money, others fame, and just a few prioritize God. The interesting thing here is that those who prioritize God are living a better life than those whose pleasure is in mammon. However, as a child of God, if you make Him your number one priority, your life will never remain the same. Most people prefer to put their wealth and fame first before thinking about God because they want to enjoy the pleasures of this life. It's quite unfortunate that even children of God have joined this trend, forgetting that all these are vanity. Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 through 33 says, So do not worry, saying, What shall I eat, or what shall I drink, or what shall I wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But first seek His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. The necessities of life like food, clothing, and shelter are undoubtedly very important. However, the problem arises when you get so busy trying your best to cater to your needs that you end up putting God aside. It also assures that putting Him first attracts all other necessities and wants like money, cars, promotion, good health, and many more. It's just like a magnet that pulls things to itself. Beloved, what's the most important thing or person in your life? What position does God take? Is He the first, second, or third? If He isn't the first, then you need to make amends. Nothing, absolutely nothing, is worth being placed above God. Listen, your primary duty on earth is to worship and serve God. Wealth, education, fame, marriage, and many of the pleasures of life are all secondary. You might want to ask why people prioritize every other thing above God. Well, it's simple they fall victim to misplaced priorities. It'll be a waste if, after all the qualifications, fame, and wealth, you neglect the very purpose of your existence. This means you've not lived. You've only been existing. Putting God first means in all you do, please Him, even in the minute areas of your life. It goes as far as examining yourself through God's standards before doing anything. For instance, daily, ask yourself questions like, Will putting on this dress displease God? The conversation I just had with that lady, did it glorify God? Are my thoughts in accordance with His will? By doing this, your existence will please the Lord. Joseph is a perfect example of someone who placed God first in his life. It didn't matter to him if he lost everything. All he cared about was making sure his life glorified God. There are many Christians today who will easily compromise for a few minutes of pleasure or promotion. Such people forget that anything gotten outside of God's will, no matter how good, won't last. Dear friend, knowing all these, would you still prefer to live your life outside of God or put Him first and have your life turned around for good? You might want to know the benefits of putting God first. Is it a trip to your dream country, instant wealth, designer clothes and shoes. Well, not exactly. All these are just an addition to the many benefits of prioritizing your Heavenly Father. When you put God first above all others, first, He'll guide your steps daily and your service to Him will be more efficient and true. You've got no idea of how perfect your steps will be if the Lord orders them. Of course, you know God can never lead you astray or to a place where you'll be harmed. King David confessed that the Lord directs his paths towards righteousness and leads him to quiet and peaceful places. What an amazing experience! You can also experience the same thing if the Lord leads and controls the affairs in your life. I mean all, not just some, but all that pertains to your existence. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 says, 
trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. When the Lord guides you, your eyes will be open to the thoughts and intents of his heart. This way, you can serve him better. Father Abraham walked with God all the days of his life, and in all he did, God came first. No wonder God established an eternal, generational covenant with him. Second, when God is first in your life, divine provision, protection, and uncommon peace will be yours. Every good and perfect gift, as you know, comes from God and is accessible to only those he deems fit. The Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19 says, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of His glory in Christ Jesus. This isn't a mere prophecy or declaration, but an assurance that God will meet those pending needs of yours. But you must be rightfully connected to God for this to be possible. Yes, aside from provision, God also protects and gives peace. Remember, He's the strong tower into which the righteous run and are saved. Don't you want to be a partaker in all of these? Imagine having peace amid chaos while people are running here and there in confusion. Despite not being exempted, you feel this deep peace within you. The primary key to experiencing this uncommon peace is strategically putting God in the rightful place in your life, and you know where this is. As you faithfully continue to live solely for God, He'll continually bless you. No wonder Abraham was so blessed, and these blessings flowed down to his third and fourth generations. Even to date, you can boldly declare that you're a partaker of Abraham's blessings. Why? Because he reaped the blessings of putting God first in his life. Won't you follow in his footsteps? Also, putting God first in your life ushers you into a realm of divine favor a favor that ushers you into marvelous opportunities that you didn't necessarily work for. That is the kind of favor you enjoy when you prioritize God. The Lord highly favored Joseph and he experienced divine promotion, which he never had the qualifications for. How about the young boy Daniel? Because of his love for God, he proposed not to defile himself with anything unclean. As a result, he found favor in the sight of God, and an excellent spirit was bestowed upon him which made the king love and favor him. When the Lord favors you, men have no choice but to favor you. Protocols will be broken for your sake, and you'll excel in everything you do. If you doubt this, check the story of Queen Esther. She exhibited a virtuous lifestyle, and most importantly, she loved the Lord. She found favor in the sight of God and the king. That's why today, young ladies are advised to emulate her lifestyle. And beloved, aside from all these, the greatest favor you can get from God is eternal life. Yes, that is the essence of your Christian journey, to make heaven at last. So in all you do, let eternal life be your target and God be your priority. After learning all the benefits of putting God first, will you still fold your hands and let nature take its course? The answer is no. So how can you put God first in your life and ensure nothing takes His place? First, you must genuinely love God with your heart and soul. It's easier to respect and please your Maker if it comes from a place of true love and sacrifice than when it's solely for the benefits attached. In loving God, you must do away with everything associated with sin, as Joseph did. Separate yourself from evil associations that might try to come between you and God. Always guard your thoughts, words, and actions according to Proverbs chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, which says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Keep your mouth free from perversity. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Ensure you always weigh your thoughts and discard anyone or anything dishonoring God and your speech should always be seasoned with love. Then when you err, turn to God in repentance. Next, you must build an intimate relationship with God through prayer and studying His Word. It's a must for every believer. It's the route to grow in God and know Him more. Make it a lifestyle to study a portion of the Bible and communicate with your Maker every day. Block out time to intentionally spend in His presence. The Psalms call to us to be still and know that He is God. Sometimes God just wants you to sit in His presence, in the stillness of your heart, and encounter Him at that moment. 
and while praying, ask God to help you know Him more. Above all, in sincerity, let Him know how much you desire to have Him come first in all affairs of your life. And talking about prayer, it's not a one-time event. Neither should it be as a ritual. Pray continually and let it flow from your heart from a place of intimacy. Prayer doesn't have to be a formal occasion done only at the dinner table or in your room on your knees. It can be done while driving, while walking through the hallways at school or work, or even doing the dishes. Praying in the small moments throughout your day will help you rely more on God and get to know Him better. Lastly, surrender your all to Him. Let go when He asks you to, even if it's a tough thing to do. When you surrender completely, you're telling God to do with you that which He pleases. You acknowledge that He's in control of your affairs, and as He leads, you humbly follow. Beloved, always let your love for God be the driving force behind everything you do. You may not always be comfortable with what He's doing in your life, but believe that He knows what's best for you as His child. When we put God first in our lives, we'll encounter tribulation. However, we're preparing ourselves for an eternity of glory to come. Focus on that. Don't compromise for the world, and shortly, you'll reap the rewards. Remember, God is wiser, stronger, and more powerful than you know. He's promising you today that if you put Him first, your life will never remain the same. I pray God bless you. There is a serious God problem in modern society. Just look around you and witness the hypocrisy and materialism that have become the norm in today's world. Unfortunately, Christians are also not exempt from this. We love to dip our toes in faith, but we keep the rest of our feet out, just in case. We've made God an option, like a toll number that we call only when we need to, or a spare key that we use only when we've lost our main keys. He is the friend we have on reserve to keep us company when our best friend isn't around. During the week, we are just like any other person in the secular world. And then on Sunday, we're back in the spirit, praising and worshiping God, kneeling down and raising our hands and calling him the Alpha and Omega. Yet all these end right at the doorstep of the church till the next Sunday. This culture is destructive and very risky for the believer. Seriously, this is not the kind of Christian we should be. It is not a lifestyle that can please God at all. We cannot treat God as an option, lead double lives, and yet expect to please Him. The Bible in Revelation 3:15 and 16 says, I know your deeds. You are neither cold nor hot. How I wish you were one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to vomit you out of my mouth. If no one has told you this before, well, here I am to tell you that you need to get serious with God now. You can't wait until you are in your 60s to get saved. You can't wait until you've had all the fun in the world. Then you can rest and say, oh well, now I can get born again. You cannot schedule getting serious with God because you never know when Christ will come. The scripture reminds us that no one, not even a single soul in the world, knows when the Son of God will come. He can come right now, tomorrow, or the Friday just before the Sunday you plan to receive salvation. Let's say you are hosting a home dinner and the invitation says 6 p.m. You get your house all ready, food prepared, table set, and then you suddenly realize it's already five o'clock and you haven't gotten yourself ready yet. You're standing there in sweats and a t-shirt and the doorbell rings. Are you kidding me, you scream? Well, guess what? Jesus isn't going to wait to come back when it's convenient for us. He's coming back when his time is right. So you better put your house in order in case your guest of honor shows up early. Every second, minute, hour, day, or year you spend on this earth is just an extended grace period to help you make a choice. God in his mercy, grace, and unconditional love gave us salvation freely. While we were sinful, wallowing in destruction, and without any hope for the future, he sent down his only son to redeem us from sin and the snares of eventual death. Salvation has been given to us at no cost. You and I have been freed of sin and are no longer slaves to it. However, God can't force you to use this power. He cannot force you to be born again. He cannot force you to love him with all your heart, mind, and soul. In the absolute freedom he gave us, 
He has left it solely up to you to decide what to do with your life. Whether you choose the narrow path or the wide one, it is all up to you. My encouragement to us today is to take God seriously. It may be all fun and games right now to sin all we want during the week and go to church on Sunday, stand in the presence of God and say how much we love Him. But when the day of judgment comes, it will be pretty bad. No one will be spared just because they used to go to church, read the Bible, or give alms to the poor. Matthew 7, through 23 Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Jeremiah 17.10 I, the Lord, search the heart. I examine the mind to reward a man according to his way by what his deeds deserve. Getting serious with God is not about missing church on a single Sunday. It is not about how you sing or dance. It is all about the invisible stuff. While it is okay for us to go to church and commune with other believers, it is not enough. Doing that alone is not sufficient to nourish our relationship with our Father. It boils down to your heart, whether you truly, truly love God, whether you have decided to live by His ways and are committed to it. Yes, church is about worshiping God and learning the Word, but you can do most of that from home. Church is also about surrounding yourself with fellow Christians and fellowshipping with them. Examine your life. Take a close, honest look at the way you do things. Do you just dip your toe in faith and keep the rest of your body out so that you can fit in the secular world too? Is God the center of it all for you, or is He just a part of the cards you're playing life with? Do you base every decision on Him and live in line with His plan for your life, or do you compromise on some and hope that He will understand? How do you start your day, and how do you end it? If someone randomly stops you in the street and asks you what the most important thing in your life is, what would you say? I know many of us, yes, me included, would be thinking of our families, businesses, health, finances, friends, money, and investments. This is because these things, by default, take up the first position in our lives because they are constantly on our minds. However, above and before any of those should be our relationship with God. He is more important than our careers, education, jobs, businesses, friends, and yes, family too. God wants to be first in our lives. He doesn't want to be second to any other thing or person. Amazingly, once we get the first step right, the rest fall into place. Once we accord God the devotion and attention He deserves, all other things begin to fall into place. Things might look like they are going great, judging by worldly measures, and this might include having a family, a decent amount of money, a group of supportive friends, some holidays here and there, etc. However, if all these things are not grounded in God, they are metaphorically the house built on sand. And when the strong winds come, the house will crumble down without a fight. Everything physical can be lost in a moment. But when we find our lives in Christ, we are able to withstand everything that comes. Both on stormy days and during strong winds, we stand firm and unshakable because God is our foundation and anchor. This might be unpopular, but it is the truth. Nothing in life is going to matter but God. Not the community you live in, the people around you, or the possessions you own. They all mean nothing compared to God and your salvation. You have to be intentional about God. You can't just sit around and hope that someday you will reach that level of grace and spiritual maturity that you desire. If you do nothing about it, you will never grow spiritually. Be intentional in your relationship with God. Recognize what needs to be done and make an effort to see that it is accomplished. Work for it. Make every second of your life count. Use every day of your life to love and serve God. I am a regular user of social media, just like everyone else with access to it. And recently I came across a post that said even though heaven is the goal, we must sin a bit while we are here. On reading this, I thought to myself, what a generation we are living in. How casual have we become in our walk with God that we would knowingly sin and then go back to Him and ask for forgiveness. How daring of us to knowingly sin for a while and then wait to show up at the gates of heaven. Let me just ask you, how often do you sin freely and think it is okay because Jesus forgave you already and you will try harder next time? A lot, I'm sure. Me too. Dear believers in Christ, let's get serious with God. He's not an option. 
He should never be one. The truth is, we have created a mess. We've gradually allowed the church to become a secular place, a place where we go to meet our friends and show off our cool clothes and fashion sense. However, all hope is not lost. The Bible says that there is hope for a tree that has been cut down because it can sprout again under the right conditions. Whether you are realizing that you have been placing God in second, third, or whatever position in your life, or you are now seeing that the people you have surrounded yourself with are living ungodly or double lives, one for Sunday and another for the week. I want to spread this message of restoration and hope. You can turn your life around any minute you want. You can begin to be sure about God at this very moment. You don't have to wait until you're older or have reached the peak of your career. You can decide to be more intentional in your walk with Christ because when all is said and done, it is the only thing that will matter. I hope that this video is a wake-up call to you, reminding you that Jesus can come at any moment. And when he does, he will only take with him those who are ready. I hope that this acts as a spiritual awakening for you and helps you realize that it is only God that matters. When you place him at the center of it all, all other things make sense. I also hope that you stay aware of the fact that this is the right moment to make things right with God and put yourself back on track. This is the time to start taking God seriously. The Word of God in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Verse 2 is of special importance, and I'll highlight the phrase, keeping our focus on Jesus. Why does the author of Hebrews emphasize keeping our eyes on Jesus? Why it is important for us as believers to keep our focus on Jesus? Why must we be careful that we don't shift our gaze elsewhere, but keep it on Christ our Lord? Because it's so easy to lose focus spiritually. It's easy to stay on track, thank God, praise Him, and testify of His works when things are great. But when life gets hard, the story changes. When we begin to face trouble, injustices, a lot of problems, and so much pain, we forget who we should be looking at. However, the Bible encourages us that even during such hard times, it's important that we keep our focus on Christ. Even when things get tough, when our applications for jobs keep getting rejected, our relationships more strained, and our families are on the verge of breaking up, we should keep our eyes on Jesus. We should never shift our gaze or attention to anything else because only Christ matters. Many things affect our lives, politics, natural disasters, relationships with people, our interests, illnesses, educational ambitions, and family life. They all have an impact on what makes up our lives. They influence our priorities and what we give our attention to. They have a lot of impact on how we see life as well. However, the only being whom we should keep atop our priorities is Jesus. Before your career, family, job, and education should be Jesus. He should be your number one priority. Even when you're going through the stormy phases of life, not once should you shift your attention from Him to whatever is troubling you. Your eyes should always be on Him, He and Him alone. Not any other person, not any other thing. Definitely not the world, but Him. The world is generally filled with so many temptations. Sometimes they may put up themselves as being very brilliant and enticing, making us focus on them instead of our Redeemer. Again, the world is so dark. It's characterized by pain and hurting and a lot of suffering. These also distract us and make us lose our focus on Christ. The Bible is making a call unto us believers to keep focusing on Christ because the niceties of this world, as appealing and enticing as they may be, are only temporary. They can make us happy, but not forever. They are worldly things, and worldly things are meant to perish at some point. Same as the struggles we encounter here on earth. They can make us lose sight of Christ and consequently our place in eternity with Him. Yet they do not last forever. They only destroy the beautiful relationship we have with Christ by making us concentrate on them. 
Evil will always be at work trying to take our eyes off of Jesus. No matter how strong the devil's work is, let our faith in God be stronger. We can avoid this by focusing on Him who calls us out of darkness and into the light, our Savior, Lord Jesus. Because they only last as long as we're here on earth, but what we have with Christ is eternal, everlasting. Traveling on the road of uncertainties that our lives are, there are way too many distractions that can make us head in the wrong direction. But keeping our eyes on Jesus will safely lead us to our rightful destination. Otherwise, we'll be lost in the wilderness. The Bible, of course, has many characters who walked with God, keeping their focus on Him even in unfavorable circumstances. But my favorite one is the story of Peter. Peter was a disciple of Jesus, and today, we can just study something about him and see how we relate to it. The story, which I'm almost certain you've called to mind by now, is where Peter walked on water. Now, just a little background check on Peter. He was a fanatic, an enthusiastic man, full of life and vibrancy. He was an extremist as well. He did things with a lot of passion. In today's world, we would say that Peter was the life of the party among Jesus' disciples. So here they are in the Sea of Galilee, and it gets stormy and they're scared. And then, as if it's not enough, they see a man walking on the water in a stormy sea. The Bible says that they were badly terrified, that they actually thought it was a ghost. At first, they were all afraid, but Jesus reassures them. Peter says, Is that you, Lord? If it is, tell me to come to you on the water. And Peter, in his usual energy, which I bet sometimes annoyed the other disciples, steps out of the boat and onto the water. Whoa! I can only imagine the thoughts of the other disciples. Peter, are you mad? But Jesus didn't think Peter was in over his head. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. Matthew chapter 29, verse 14. I want this to stick in our minds that for as long as Peter kept his eyes on Jesus, he was okay. He walked on the water. The only man who walked on water actually apart from Jesus. As long as he did not take his eyes off of Jesus, he walked on that sea as he would on dry land because his focus was on Christ who enables us to do all things. On account of his word, Peter had stepped onto the water. His eyes were on Christ who was also walking on the water. That's all that it took Peter to walk on water as Jesus did, keeping his eyes, his attention, his concentration, and his focus on the Lord. For as long as he did that, Peter was doing great, until something happened. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me! Verse 30. Let's take the first part of verse 30. When Peter saw the waves, he began to sink because fear came over him. He was doing great until he decided, ah, let me take a look at my surroundings. Let me see what's next to me. Relating this to our lives, this is when you've been trusting God with everything, and then suddenly, the reality of your situation comes into your mind. This is that moment when you begin to weigh your current situation and the probabilities or promises the Bible has for you, and suddenly you gasp, can this really happen? Can I get out of this complex scenario? Can I overcome this temptation? Or am I beyond salvation? That moment when you take your attention from Christ and shift it to what's happening around you is when things begin to head south. That's when you begin to sink. When Peter was walking well on the water, wasn't the sea still stormy? It was. Very much so, as a matter of fact. The wind was blowing very hard and the waves were rocking. Did he sink? No. Why? Because his gaze was on Jesus. But then he had this distracted moment and boom, there were so many waves and winds over here. And that's how he lost his balance and began to sink the moment he looked and took in his surroundings. When his focus was on Jesus, he was fine. He shifted it to the situation around him and he began to sink. Walking on water didn't mean that the sea was calm. It only meant that Peter chose to focus on something else or rather someone else who was way greater than the sea, the waves, and even himself. And that is how he managed for the short while that he did. When we focus on Jesus, he doesn't just make the problems in our life go away. He doesn't immediately calm the storms we're in. He doesn't establish immediate peace. 
but he makes us focus on him who gives peace that we cannot comprehend. He enables us to see beyond the waves, the storms, the troubles, and into the eyes of the one who is greater than all things. He keeps us focused on him because there's nothing that has overcome his power. When we focus on Christ, we're not merely ignoring the storms that we may be going through, but we're simply acknowledging that he who is in us is greater than anything else that could be around us. And for that reason, we are focusing on him. We're likely to lose it all if we want to do it our way, in our own style, and by our own power. We have to realize that we can't walk on water if we haven't been empowered by Christ to do so. Peter walked on the waves on the word that Jesus gave him. There are times when we're too preoccupied with being our own saviors that we forget that we have a Father who cares about us and who wants to take care of our burdens. Sometimes things get under our skin so much that we forget God's role and ability in the whole process. Relying on ourselves will only make us discouraged and frustrated. Which takes us to the second limb of verse 30, which Peter is asking Jesus to come and save him. Lord, save me! Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said. Why do you doubt? Verse 31 which we can rephrase as Jesus asking him, why did you take your eyes off me? Why did you let the waves scare you? Why didn't you keep your focus on me? Nevertheless, Jesus saved Peter. Just picture him gesturing at Peter to turn his eyes from the waves and telling him, Peter, I'm right here. Look at me. Look into my eyes. Keep your focus on me. That's what the Lord desires of us daily, to keep our eyes on him in the stormy seas that characterize our lives, in the so many challenges we face and the pain we endure, in the uncertainties of life, even in the many temptations that threaten to lure us out of the path of righteousness, the Lord is telling you to keep your eyes on Him. The distractions might be many, but if you're intent on fixing your gaze on Christ, you can do it. You can keep your eyes on Christ always. In this world, there will be moments of joy, happiness, celebrations, and peace. However, that's not all. There will also be moments of sadness, tears, and pain. But in all of this, we need to know that God has a higher and better perspective than we do. He sees all things. He knows all things. He knows the end from the beginning. Your confidence should be in Him. Knowing He has a reason for everything and not your current situation. We need to know that our perspectives are limited, and they can affect the way we react to things. We need to be keen about what God thinks about every single thing. He has the same purpose for every event in your life, whether good or bad, beautiful or ugly, all for your good. Or have you forgotten His Word in Romans 8.28? And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him. One biblical story that explains this better is the story of the widow Zarephath. When Elijah came to her and asked for a piece of bread, her initial response was full of faithlessness. 2 Kings 17.12 says, As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son, so that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first make a small loaf of bread from what you have and bring it to me, and then make something for yourself and your son. I want you to pay attention to the next sentence. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry, until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. Realize what she just said at first, that we may eat and die. This was her view of the situation at hand. While she focused on herself, her son, and the famine in the land, she believed death would finally catch up with her family. But when Elijah told her what God had said, she did not hesitate to do as she was told. This shows that her focus moved from whatever she was feeling to God, and she began to see the possibility of living past that day she began to see that God may have permitted the famine to show her that he can multiply even the littlest of all things. 
This is a story of faith, one that should encourage you to look up to God even amid the turmoil. When you focus on God, the world transforms before your eyes. It is like a veil is lifted, and you begin to see the profound beauty and purpose in everything around you. The reason we still feel offended by God when things don't go as expected is that our focus is not on Him. We hate pain because we cannot see what God can do through our pain. We hate battles because we are short-sighted and fail to see that there aren't victories without battles. In summary, our minds are fixed on ourselves, so we cannot see things differently. In a world often clouded by distractions, stress, and chaos, turning your gaze toward God can bring clarity and a sense of inner peace. With God as your focal point, the trivial concerns and worries that once consumed your thoughts suddenly fade into the background, replaced by a profound understanding of every event in your life. You will see things differently when you focus on God because you will start seeing His power and glory in every aspect of existence. The lessons hidden in adversity become apparent. The disciples of Jesus said to him, Don't you care if we perish? This was their perspective of things. They had their minds and eyes fixed on themselves. They could not see God in the boat. Perhaps if they focused on God, they would have realized that Jesus could not have drowned. Jesus had done so many miracles before then. They could have remembered that he had the power to stop the storm. This applies to our lives today. If we can remember that God is always with us, we will not have to fret and feel abandoned. Every feeling of abandonment comes from a heart not focused on God. James 1, 2-3 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. What kind of men can wake up in the morning and while they pray say to God, Lord, thank you for pain? It may look absurd, but the disciples of Jesus were this kind of man. They did not nag or murmur for every challenge they encountered. They did not feel abandoned because of the persecution they faced. Rather, they thanked God for finding them worthy to partake of His sufferings. Whatever is happening to you has two views, yours and God's. You could see it as you will or as God sees it. One perspective results in worry, while the other brings about peace. You might be in a season where it looks like you are going down with each passing second, and you are wondering, what is happening to me? Lord, don't you care if I perish? You may even be convinced that God no longer cares about you, or maybe He has forgotten you. But I am here to tell you this, if you change your perspective, you will see things differently. Your response to every situation reveals your focus. Your state of mind in every situation says a lot about how you see things. If the disciples of Jesus could let go of their natural sense and human nature to look up to God, then we can. They believe in Jesus, and so do we. If they could see troubles big enough to swallow them up, yet focus on what God wanted to make out of the situation, we too can. Nothing changes about our situation until we change how we look at them. The only way to do this is to focus on God. Your mind will automatically become renewed when God becomes your attention. You will no longer have to go through life sad and depressed. You will have more than enough reasons to rejoice amidst sorrowful experiences. Not everyone is called to this life. Only the believer is ready to make God their focal point. This believer lives by faith and not by sight. What this means is he does not see things as other people do. He sees things as God sees them. He sees fast. He sees the end of his suffering and realizing that God will never leave nor forsake him. He rejoices even though he does not have a tangible reason. He begins to see everything as a blessing rather than focusing on all that is wrong. Every sunrise and sunset becomes a reminder of the beauty of creation. Every smile and act of kindness embodies God's love for them. This focus on God also shifts your perspective on life's challenges. Rather than viewing difficulties as insurmountable obstacles, you see them as opportunities for growth and spiritual evolution. With faith as your compass, you will find strength to endure, wisdom to navigate, and hope to carry you through even the darkest storms. Focusing on God realigns your priorities. Material possessions lose their grip on your heart, 
and you begin to value the eternal over the temporal. Love, compassion, and service to others become your guiding principles as you recognize that the true measure of a meaningful life is not what you accumulate, but the love you share and the impact you make on the lives of others. So you see that your attitude when trouble comes is not the only thing that changes when your focus shifts to God. Your attitude towards yourself, people, and the things of God are all affected. There is a perspective that inspires hatred towards yourself and everyone around you. You may begin to feel like everyone is doing well except you. You may even begin to see God as a partial and inconsiderate father, all because your attention is on yourself and the problems in your life. Learn to take your eyes off the storm to the Prince of Peace. If he is asleep, then as a true disciple, you should not be afraid of sleeping. If God seems to be quiet about your situation, rather than panic about the weight of the problem, focus on getting his attention. You can't stop these seasons from coming once it's time, but you can change how you feel about them. You can change how you react to them by focusing on God. Think about what God can do. Think about what He did in the past about such situations. Meditate on His promises and remind yourself that He is faithful. Focusing on God nurtures a sense of gratitude that permeates your daily existence. You start to see blessings in the simplest of moments and thankfulness becomes your constant companion. The air you breathe, the food on your table, and the relationships you cherish are all seen as gifts from a benevolent creator. It keeps negativity far from you. It rejuvenates your entire being, affecting your mental health positively. In your relationships, focusing on God helps you perceive the interconnectedness of all beings. You understand that we are part of a divine plan and every person you encounter is a unique and cherished creation of God. This awareness promotes tolerance, empathy, and a commitment to unity and understanding. Realizing that God shows you mercy every day of your life will teach you to be merciful unto others. Receiving forgiveness from God daily will teach you to forgive others easily. It changes the way you see life and people generally. Looking up to God humbles you and makes you wise. Ultimately, it helps you to live with a deep sense of purpose. Personal ambitions, emotions, and mere feelings no longer drive your actions. The desire to fulfill your divine calling now drives your actions. You will become a beacon of light and love in your world, radiating a kind of goodness and compassion that flows from your relationship with God. Romans 12.2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. The world has a pattern. The people of the world have a pattern. There is a way they see things completely different from the way God sees things. God is calling you to learn from Him. Forsake the perspectives you were born with and learn new ones that lead to life. You can see the world through a lens of divine love, purpose, and beauty. Life's challenges are reframed as opportunities, and every moment becomes a chance to draw closer to God. Focusing on God is an invitation to a life of profound meaning, inner peace, and a heightened appreciation for all God does for you. I honestly pray you will accept this invitation. Amen.